So last time we derived our equation of state. And this shows a, a, a different version of the gas law. We have to keep in mind during the ballooning that this R is in fact not the universal gas law R, but it's the, the specific gas constant and that in fact it's equal to the universal gas, gas law R divided by the molar mass. Because when we look at different types of gas, we will have to use different molar masses. So those versions, those two versions, are the versions we will use uh, to understand how balloons generate lift. Well, the first one to really understand how balloons generate lift is Archimedes. He talked about hydrostatics instead of aerostatics and the, the buoyancy principle was something he discovered. Archimedes was in, in many respects the first uh, engineer and scientist, engineer slash scientist, and he had a lot of inventions but also tried to understand the physical principles. And he did the same for, for buoyancy. And this already in the third century before Christ. It's a pity that a Roman soldier killed him over some dispute about circles in the sand or something. Um, because who knows what other inventions he might have made in ancient times. He was a brilliant guy and an example for all of us. And let's have a look at how he uh, tried to understand the buoyancy and how this helps us to create a formula for the lift of balloons. So what did Archimedes do? Well, the first thing he started doing was to consider the situation before there was any balloon. And in fact, I'm going to talk about air. He looked mostly at water, but the principles are the same. So I'm going to talk about balloons and air, but, and he looked at bodies submerged in the water. But the principle is the same. So he first looked at the, the volume of, uh, of air um, when it was still there. And then he said, so what happens if I then would take the air away and I would suddenly have a vacuum in between. So here we have air inside and outside. This is the air. And here we only have air on the outside. Well, we have uh, his, his, his brilliant idea was that these, this air doesn't move. So there is a force of gravity as for anything, also for air, which pulls the air down. But apparently there is another force which keeps the air in place, which has to be the same as the, uh, the uh, gravity. So this means that when we would take the air out, we would not need to calculate the integral, the sum of all these little forces on the, along the surface of the balloon, because we already know the outcome. The total force has to be the same as the weight of this volume of air. And this means that for this given volume, we already know the maximum amount of lift which would be available for a balloon occupying this volume. That would simply be the weight of the air times the gravity acceleration. In other words, the density times the volume, that's the, the mass, times the, the gravity acceleration. This results in the, the weight of the air and therefore the, the maximum lift force. And of course the density has to be the density of the air which was there before we took it out. If we now have a balloon, then in this, this same volume we will put something different. And let's focus for now on the, the lift generated by the gas in the balloon. So I'll, I'll say a bit about the payload and the weight and of the balloon and everything, but let's focus on the, the physical process here on the gases. Then the lift force is of course less. It's not the rho air times the volumes times density, but it's the difference from between the two weights. So uh, you have to subtract what we put in its place, which is the density of the gas times the volume times the gravity acceleration. And this, and of course in, in reality you will also still have to reduce the weight of the, uh, the payload, of the balloon and everything. But 
this is something if you talk about the total body. Now I want to look about the part that generates the lift, so I'm going to leave this out for now and look at uh, the gross lift of a balloon. I can also write this in another way. I can say the lift force is therefore rho of the atmosphere, this, which is the air, times the volume of the balloon times the gravity acceleration times 1 minus the rho of the gas divided by the rho of the air or atmosphere. And this is in its generic form the equation which governs the lift of balloons, both hot air as well as gas balloons. But let's see how this plays out for the different types of balloons, types of balloons. For that I would have first have to look at what varies inside and outside of the balloon, depending on the different type of, uh, of balloon that we have. And therefore I will use the, the gas law and I'll make a, a slight assumption. I will say that the pressure inside P1 and the pressure outside the balloon is equal. In reality this is not true. The pressure inside the balloon is slightly larger to, to, to in, it, to, in case we have an elastic balloon to keep its shape. But for weather balloons which are not uh, at, at their maximum volume this is actually pretty close and also to, for hot air balloons which are even open underneath the pressure inside and outside is the same. But in general this assumption doesn't hurt because the pressure is huge at sea level. It's 10 to the power 5 pascal, so uh, 100,000 newton per square meter or 10,000 kilogram per square meter. That means that even if there's a slight force, it's practically the same. If there would be thousands of newtons difference, the balloon would immediately explode. So if we now fill in our equation of state, we can then also say that rho 1 r m1 times t1 is the same as rho 2 r divided by m2 divided by uh, multiplied by t2. And this I can also rewrite if I look at the ratio of the two densities. I can say, well, the, the gas constant is of course the same on both sides, so here I can write 1. And this means that I will have T2 on this side and divided by T1 times M1 divided by M2. So looking at the two types of balloons, the hot air balloons where this part is different and the molar mass will be the same, or gas balloons where this part will be different and this will be the same, we can see what the ratio of the densities is and what the actually generated lift is. Let's try to do this for both types of balloons. Running out of space, I'm going to the next slide for this. So let's start off by looking at a, uh, uh, an, a, a gas balloon. So we had, the last equation that we had was F lift is rho atmosphere times V times G times 1 minus rho gas divided by rho atmosphere. Well, looking at our previous equation, we see that the equation of the, 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 the ratio of the two uh, densities can be replaced by the ratio of the two molar masses. So we see here the molar masses, we see he, here the density, so rho 1 divided by rho 2 is m1 divided by m2 if the, uh, the temperature is the same. So this means we can replace this part of the equation, oh, let's go to white, so, by the molar masses divided by m air and the remainder of the equation stays the same. 
rho atmosphere Vg, and this is the F lift. Well, this is, this is, these are quantities which we know. We generally know the volume of the balloon, so we know this one. We can look up the weather, the temperature and the pressure of today, and with the temperature and the pressure, and P is rho RT, we can then calculate the density as P divided by RT. So using the weather information, we can calculate the density of the atmosphere today, the G we know, and for the ratio of these molar masses, we just need to know the type of gas which we have. And it's good to know, for instance, that for helium, the molar mass is around 4. Uh, for air, so for the atmosphere, it's 28.97. And this is, by the way, grams per mole. Grams per mole, so for kilograms, which is the SI unit, we would use different numbers. But since we divide the two, as long as we have the same units, it will still work. Hydrogen is even better and has, uh, has, it of, has two gram per mole. So it's even better uh, at, at generating lift. But as we saw with Hindenburg, has some other drawbacks. So now we normally see that these two are used. And we also see that the ratio becomes around six seventh is a sort of indication which means uh, one seven sorry I, I'm saying it the wrong way the ratio becomes one seventh here and what happens then is that one minus one seventh then of course becomes six sevenths so in other words the ratio the, the lift of a helium balloon is rho v g for the atmosphere, times 6 seventh. Uh, if you want to have the exact number, you have to use these exact numbers, but 6 seventh. So this also means that with helium, you get 6 seventh of the weight of the air you replace as lift force, which is a lot. It's 6 seventh on your way to vacuum uh, uh, lift, the maximum lift that you could get. Let's also see how this compares to a hot air balloon which amount of hot air would be able to generate, or what temperature would you need for hot air to get the same amount of lift. So we start off again with the same equation. F lift is rho V G atmosphere times one minus rho gas divided by rho atmosphere. And if we then look at our equation of state and the ratio of the densities, we see that now we have uh, the molar mass with a hot air balloon is the same, so this is, is the same, but this is different, the temperature is different. And in fact we see that it is reversed, so rho 1 divided by rho 2 is T2 divided by T1. So reverse the order in the ratio, which means that we have to write here T atmosphere divided by T gas to keep the equation the same. Rho V G atmosphere is the lift force. Well, now we're going to use a slightly different notation. What is the T of the atmosphere? That's just the temperature outside. And the temperature of the gas, we will use T plus delta T to show the increase in temperature which we have due to the, uh, to the hot air. And if we write it as such, we can simplify it a bit. 1 minus T divided by T plus delta T. And this is equal to T plus S1 is equal to T plus delta T divided by T plus delta T minus T divided by T plus delta T. And this then results in rho V G, again the rho of the atmosphere, times delta T over T plus delta T. 
these are quantities we know. We know, again, with the meteorological information, we can calculate the density of the atmosphere. We know the volume of the balloon. We know G. And we know how much we have heated the balloon. And we know the temperature of today. If we now would want to generate the same amount of lift as with a helium balloon, this should be 6 seventh. So this means that it would be something like 6 divided by 1 plus 6, because that's 6 seventh. In other words, the delta T would have to be 6 times the temperature. And this is Kelvin, so if the temperature is around uh, 20 degrees, we are close to 300 Kelvin, 20, uh, 293, close to 300 Kelvin. So that means an increase of temperature of 1800 degrees Kelvin, which would result in a temperature equal to a blowtorch. So this shows that this is something, of course, you wouldn't do. You would burn your balloon. So the lift of hot air is generally much smaller than the lift of helium. This is one of the conclusions we can draw from this calculation. Also with this two formula, you can now calculate the lift of any balloon, whether it's gas or hot air. So this is the result of our derivation. We see the general lift formula for balloons in the first line. We see the hot air uh, balloon lift formula and we see the gas balloon lift formula. We also have compared the two and this allows us to, to look at uh, helium and hot air. And uh, we saw that helium is much better at generating lift than hot air is. So this answers the first of our list of questions. Which type of balloon generates more lift? We also see that you have still both types of balloon that are being used, helium and hot air. Why is this? Well, helium is something that if you let it escape in the atmosphere, it will go to the top of the atmosphere and will leave, try to leave the atmosphere. This also shows that helium balloons can get very high. So helium balloons are better for reaching very high altitudes. But it also means that helium is scarce. There's always a little bit of helium in the, in the atmosphere, but most of it tries to escape to the, to, to the edge of the atmosphere. But luckily it's also generated at sea level because helium uh, nuclei are basically alpha radiation. So alpha decay in the earth crust constantly generates helium. In effect, you will find helium in, uh, in, uh, in caves, especially in, in America. Uh, which is why Germany couldn't access it at, uh, anymore. Um, and this is where helium is, is captured and uh, then sold. But it's limited, it's, it's not generated very fast with this alpha decay, and which means we might in the future run out of, of helium at some point. Um, so helium is also much more expensive. So this is one of the reasons to use hot air. For hot air you only need a heat source, and uh, this is cheaper than getting helium. And of course, with hot air, it's much easier to control the lift force because you can control the temperature. And with helium, once you have uh, let it escape, you will have to supply it again yourself. So hot air is easier to control, is cheaper, and therefore for recreational flying and low altitude flying, you will see mainly hot air. But when it comes down to record flights or very high flights, you will see uh, helium. Um, you will also wonder what altitude can you reach with a helium balloon and if you can get much higher. Um, that, is, that is actually dependent, you can see it in this formula, it's actually dependent on the, the volume. You may uh, know that weather balloons are relatively small at sea level and there's the, the balloon is actually very floppy and that is to allow the gas to expand when it, uh, when it gets higher. And the maximum altitude is in fact determined by the maximum volume of the helium balloon. If it gets too large, this volume, the balloon will explode and that's the maximum uh, altitude. So those are the, uh, the, the answers to some of the, the questions we, uh, we raised. Um, we also 
uh, you also might wonder, uh, with, with helium balloons, you might know them as party balloons. And one of the questions we raised is, how many party balloons would you need to lift off yourself? Well, with these equations, you can calculate this for yourself. Assume for this that a, a party balloon has a volume of around 11 liters. And let's for now ignore the actual weight of the balloon. Uh, maybe there's some weight, but then we have a slightly larger balloon. So just look at the, the lift generation of this, this gas of 11 liters of, of uh, helium for one party balloon. And try to calculate yourself how many party balloons you would need to lift off. In fact, this, this, is, uh, this has been tried, uh, low altitude flight with uh, helium balloons. There are in fact uh, uh, examples of uh, people trying to, to do this. Um, a, a priest in South America, or in this case an American, who uh, tried to lift off with very large party balloons, actually larger than the 11 liters. And he, uh, he flew around with this, and his, his way of altitude control, because helium wants to go on forever, his uh, Altitude uh, control was actually a, a BB gun, which allowed him to to uh, destroy some of the to shoot some of the balloons above him if he wanted if he was uh, getting too high, and if he wanted to rise again, he would drop some weight. He had extra uh, soda cans with him and, and bottles which he would drop as weight, and in this way he could control his altitude, and was in fact disrupting the the, the traffic of a of a nearby uh, airport where they, he uh, crossed final approach and uh, annoyed a lot of air traffic controllers. But calculate yourself for normal party balloons, 11 liters, how many you would, uh, you would need to, uh, to do this. There's one rhetorical question which uh, I posed at the beginning, which I have not answered yet. And that is, if we have this balloon that doesn't increase in size and there's an equilibrium of forces, how does the balloon, what is up? what generates the actual lift force, because we haven't looked at that. We looked at the overall weight and we, we, we uh, discussed the, the lift, but we haven't really looked at the level of what is actually happening around the balloon. How does the balloon know that it should go up? And this we will do in the next lecture.